comes out of here to their class. And uh, we will turn in our Bibles to Obadiah. Obadiah. Just a short little book we started last week, just some introductory remarks. And uh, basically what we covered last week, the root cause of their problem was pride. And I wanted to take a little time this week to kind of fi uh, finish up on uh, where, where I left off last week and then get into the second part uh, this evening, and that will be verses 10 through 16, Obadiah's denunciation of Edom's treatment of Judah. And one of the things I tried to stress last week was they, they, they were full of pride. The Edomites were full of pride, and that led to behavior that was destructive to them and certainly to their brother Israel. And that led to a number of, of other uh, things and then ultimately it led to their destruction. And the scripture says, pride goeth before the fall. And if there's one caution here to be learned from this is that don't allow pride to take root in your life because at some point in time, it's going to manifest some bad fruit, and that's going to warrant God's chastisement and or judgment. And I'll have more to say about that today. But one of the other things that led to their excessive pride, if I could sum it up with one word, was their success. Uh, they were very good as far as their diplomacy was concerned. They certainly had a lot of wealth that they uh, built up through the Caribbeans that passed through so they could charge tolls and trade goods and wares and so forth. And also, last week I covered their location. Uh, they lived in the mountains. And uh, so their position where they lived basically gave them a, a fortress of sorts where uh, they felt that they could not be conquered. And so as we talked about it last week, the Lord said, no, that's not going to be the case. You will be destroyed. And so a couple of the things that I didn't cover last week that I want to try to uh, take care of today, and then we'll get into the second part, verses 5 through 6, uh, talking about their wealth. And he says, verse number 5, If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? And so what he's trying to say here is robbers would come in and basically take what they needed, but what he's stressing here is they're going to take everything. They're going to search the hidden places for their hidden treasures, and they're going to take everything from them. They're going to strip them completely bare of any wealth that they may have had. And then he goes on in the verse to say, uh, If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? So it gives you kind of a, a glimpse into the degree of this chastisement, this judgment that God was sending to Edom, that they would be completely without any wealth or resources in that regard at all. The second thing that God takes away from them is their alliances. In verses 7 through 9, all the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in them. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So their alliances would be destroyed. Their, their diplomacy would no longer work. So the very people that they trusted in to help them, maybe militarily or financially, uh, would be against them. But I think there's an important lesson for us to learn here as believers, and it's this. We need to be careful with the alliances that we make with people and be guarded, especially when it comes to worldly affairs. And I think all too often churches in America are making alliances with the world. 
and that is coming back to haunt them even at this very hour. Ours is not to make an alliance with the world. Ours is to be an obedient, our obedience to God. Ours is to serve God, to promote God's business or God's gospel. It's to promote the word of God and it's to promote holiness and sanctification and godliness and not worldliness. And churches today are compromising with the world and allowing worldliness, worldly thinking, worldly religion and worldly spirituality i don't even want to use the word spirituality with that but worldly morality into the church and it shouldn't be that way the church should be was called to be a sanctified institution separated from the world and the bible is pretty clear uh, anybody that loves the world love of the father is not in him friendship with the world is enmity with god romans 12 be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And so here are the Edomites. They make an alliance with their neighbors, the nations, the heathen, and now it comes back around where the heathen are the ones that are going to be used by God to judge them. And so what or who they thought were their friends were no longer their friends or weren't really their friends. And I think that's one of the dangers that we get into. Sometimes as Christians, we put way too much confidence in the world and not enough confidence in God. You know, there's something to be said about being unevenly yoked with unbelievers. And I understand we have our business, we conduct our affairs in the world, and I get all of that. You go, go to a secular world, uh, you know, workplace, you do your business in the banks, and I get all of that. But there's got to be a line that we will not cross over for fear of offending God, for fear of compromising the business that we've been called to as Christians. And I realize it's, it's a delicate balance for many of us, but we've got to seek that in our lives so that there's less entanglement with the world and, and a closer walk with God through that. And I think the Edomites would have done a whole lot better had they sought out God's will and counsel rather than going to the heathen nations for their support. So that's one of the things there that he covers. And then verse number eight talks about wisdom being destroyed. So with understanding comes responsibility. And sometimes with that, there comes a haughty spirit. The Edomites had that. And so with, with the world with wisdom, we get to thinking we don't need God because we think we're smarter than God. And the Bible says wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. And again, as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our walk with the Lord, as we draw closer to him, uh, his wisdom becomes more important to us and the world's wisdom less and less important. And then the military, verse number nine, is destroyed. The brave men turned to cowards. Uh, they grow faint of heart. So a might, an army that was mighty is now rendered weak or ineffective. And I was sharing with George just a few moments ago, I said there's so many similarities to Nineveh, uh, what God did with the Ninevites, what God did with, the, with their armies, and basically reduced them down to nothing and destroyed them. There was no protection, there was no fight left in them whatsoever. So there was no defense for the Edomites. All the things that they trusted in were systematically taken away. Their defenses were taken away, their diplomacy, their allies, if you will, were taken away, their riches were taken away, the wisdom was taken away, their military was taken away. They had absolutely no defense against the enemies. And now today we're gonna to talk about Obadiah's denunciation of Edom's treatment of Judah. One thing we want to be careful with, with pride, is what it leads to in terms of how we treat one another. And I think this is an important truth that we, we can certainly learn from the Edomites, that we don't get too high or haughty, uh, too prideful, where we look down on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we are, indeed, a very unique institution. And there are a lot of things that are happening today, at this very hour, to churches all over the country. And 
we need to be careful of that. You know, we judge people. Oh, they have them church services and they've got people in the church. And what about COVID and all of this and judgments being passed back and forth. And that stuff shouldn't happen. Uh, let every man be responsible and accountable to God for his own work. And more importantly, to his conscience. Now, we got churches in California. I think one of them is, is pretty close to having their electricity uh, shut off, I think. Uh, the lease for the church is is being taken away from them. Um, and then another one, there's something about singing not being allowed in churches in California. I think there's actually a, a, a lawsuit in place on, on that as well. I can't imagine going to church and not being able to sing. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine not being able to fellowship. And I'm certainly not going to judge another preacher if he goes forward with it. We, we know a number of people um, been from different you know, camps, but they're all fighting the same battle. And we also need to be careful how we judge a brother or in judging a brother that falls in struggles or has, you know, something come up in their life and they're just down and they're out and they're just trying to make it by. Because sometimes, you know, you can, you can get that spirit of haughtiness and you look down and say, wow, glad I'm not like that person. Boy, they, they've got a weak faith. Boy, they they're just not, they're not going to cut up. They're not going to make it. They're, you know, we, we ought to be there to support them and encourage them. Uh, because you know what? Maybe someday your faith will be challenged and you'll find out how weak you are. Maybe someday a trial will come up in your life and you'll realize, whoa, I wasn't prepared for this. And you'll realize that you need the help and the prayers and the support of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right? And so when we talk about the Edomites here, we're going to see some things that they did to Israel uh, to, just to kind of keep them beat down and, and they, they just kept that pressure on them and it gives a, a better understanding of why God judged them as harshly as he did. So we're going to begin uh, reading in verse number 10 and the Bible says for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, which is Israel, shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You note the use of that word calamity is mentioned several times there. Repetition. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. So in part two, we learn the specifics of why this judgment was sent to the Edomites. The Edomites were malicious, they were harsh, they were mean, they were cruel-spirited, they showed no grace and no humility toward Israel. And we talked about pride, we talked about how self-deceived they were, we talked about how heady they were because of all the things that they had, the privileges that they, they had. They were filled with pride. And we see today the fruits of that pride that is un checked. So the great sin of Edom on top of pride was their lack of kindness and charity towards their brother. Now that's the lesson that we really need to learn. We need to focus on what is our charity? What is our, how is our treatment toward our brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, there's, there's fussing and fighting sometimes in, in churches and within Christendom in general. And I think Folks need to kind of take a couple of steps back and look at their relationship with God 
and make sure that they are doing everything that they should be doing and doing it well and according to God's will and that there are no you know, hidden secrets in their hearts and sin in their life uh, before they judge another brother. I think the text says, remove the mote from your own eye before you remove the splinter from your brother's eye. And it also says on how we're to love, what's the gauge of our love, how do we measure that? And it's simply this, we are to love and to forgive as Christ has loved us and forgiven us. It, it's helpful to look at our relationship with others in light of our relationship with the Lord. That should be the first thing that we do. What is our relationship with the Lord? How are we tracking? How are we doing? And then that gauges us. It regulates us in how we treat and love one another. Be because any one of us could fall. Any one of us could have a bad week or a bad day or a bad month. And so we need to be sensitive to that because God could bring it back to us. You know, whatever you measure out, that will be needed back to you. So we want to be careful about that. So here's a couple things we'll talk about in verses 10 through 11. Violence against their brother was the one thing, uh, one of the things that they did. And um, as a result of their violence, they would be brought to shame and would be cut off. They stood by, they watched as Israel was being taken captive by the enemy, verse number 11. Uh, it was seen when they would not allow the uh, passage for Israel when they were journeying through the wilderness. If you look at Numbers chapter 20, they wanted to pass through, and the Edomite says, no, you're not passing through here. And they, you know, they went back and forth, look, we'll pay for any water or whatever, uh, just let us pass through, and the Edomites would not let them pass through. So you can see this is a big problem going all the way back. And the Edomites just kept you know, building on top of that more and more and more. Even Psalm 137, verse number 7 says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. So here's Jerusalem being judged, and the Edomites are saying, Yeah, just burn it all down to the ground. Just get rid of them. Get rid of them all. There's no compassion. There was no pity, no humility, no charity, certainly no love that was being shown towards them. Our brother... If we get a lesson from this, our brother is one that we should encourage. Our brother is one that we should love. Our brother is one that we should defend and look out for and encourage our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are a body. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We are one. We should be striving together, not against each other. Amen. Christian charity is important, especially in a church and especially during times of duress. When you look at it nationally, the things that are going on, we should be yoking together, praying. Um, I, I don't know how to word this, praying together as a church, but certainly Christians should be praying in unison for a revival to take place, uh, that we might, uh, as he says in Timothy, that we might dwell peaceably with all men. Pray for all kings and all those in leadership, that we might live godly with all holiness and peaceably with all men. Um, I realize, you know, when you're, you know, when you're, you're lost, you have a kind of a different worldview and a different perspective and you treat people differently. It, it should be, there should be a notable difference between the people of God and the people of the world. Amen. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there isn't. You know, I mentioned in, 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 in my um, comments before we started the message, I said, you know, people like coming to a church where they feel loved, they feel welcome, there's a good spirit in the church. You know, some of them have been to churches and you can tell right away there's tension there and it's not healthy. The spirit can sense that. And, you know, those that are sensitive to it don't want any part of it. And churches shouldn't, your brothers and sisters shouldn't be fighting with one another. Get your issues reconciled and, and figure it all out. Um, let's go to Proverbs real quick. 24. Proverbs 24, verse number 12. They rejoiced at their downfall. They rejoiced at their downfall. Proverbs 24. We should not rejoice or laugh at another brother or sister that may fall or stumble or get caught up in sin or struggle in life. I don't think there's any occasion there to laugh or to take any joy in it. We should sorrow with them that sorrow. 
we should feel the grief and bear their burdens and laughing and mocking and rejoicing and ha ha, you know, that's great. I'm so glad to see brother so-and-so finally got taken down. That's such a wicked spirit. Yeah. It's ungodly. Yeah. It's unchristlike. And that kind of spirit's the one that'll bring judgment on you. And so here in 24, beginning of verse number 15, the Bible says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. And let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it and it displease him. And he turn away his wrath from him. And I think here's a here's a, a verse of scripture that says don't don't even laugh when your enemy falls. Yeah. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Lest the Lord see that and, and remove his reproach from that person. So there's a there's a mode of conduct, a, a spirit that children of God ought to have. And and believe me, it's hard. Uh, we look at what's going on in the world, we don't want to see all the wickedness in the world. We don't want to see the blatant blasphemy and immorality and godlessness and Christlessness going on in the world. It's like, wow, there's such wickedness and oppression and attacks on the church. And, it, you know, you get into a position where, ha ha, you know, it's good to see them fall. You know what? But for the grace of God, there go I. And so, it, you know, it's something that even I have to learn not to rejoice in that kind of a thing. Uh, take glee or be happy about it just say you know what that's God dealing with them in his righteousness and holiness and judging them as he always does in righteousness it's part of what's going to happen to the wicked but here back in Obadiah verse number 12 but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger so it's, number one, a sign of a wicked heart to look on when your brother is going through a calamity and rejoice in his trouble or his fall. And the sense here to look on is usually uh, taken as uh, being applied to men. They lie in wait uh, and they wait to see a brother or sister fall and then they rejoice at what they see happening to that person. And I think sometimes the spirit can get so bad, it can be so much tension between a brother and a brother, a brother and a sister, a sister and a sister. And if you don't get that thing reconciled, if that root of bitterness gets in there and it continues to grow and grow and grow, then you get this kind of scenario that plays out. The one brother rejoices over the other brother that falls and says, good, he deserved it. And I knew it was gonna happen. I saw it happening. I saw all the signs. And I'm not, I'm not going to pray for him. I'm not going to encourage him. I'm not going to lift him up. I hope he falls completely. I hope he leaves the church. I hope he falls out of the ministry. That's a wicked, wicked way to think about your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a thing in Galatians called restoration. If a brother or sister falls, then our first response to be, let's pray for him, let's encourage, let's see if we can help them, and let's get them restored to the church, because I don't want them going outside to to the world I, I don't want them to be consumed by the world and that should be the same attitude that you folks have we don't want to see our brothers and sisters being consumed by the world and this is our uh, I guess our little protective bubble each other this church our time together our fellowship and praying for one another encouraging one another hey I haven't seen you in church in a while you okay everything all right you need some help with something or somebody comes in and look down Hey, you look a little off today. Is everything all right? Uh, something I can pray for you about? You want to go out for a coffee? Well, you know, just be there to encourage them. And the Edomites, they saw Israel getting taken down, and they looked on and said, wow, that's, it, you know, they're rejoicing over it. They thought it was a great thing. To look on also means to look on with indifference. Just no mind at all. No remorse, no sympathy, no sadness, no concern as they watch their brother suffer. I, I can't imagine any of us doing that, just looking on and seeing somebody suffer and not trying to offer a helping hand. Now, I'm not saying we all can minister in the same way because we're all different. We have different backgrounds. We've been through different trials. 
And some people are better equipped in certain situations to minister to certain people. But you know, what goes a long way with a lot of people is just somebody acknowledging and saying, hey, you know what, I may not be able to help you. I may not have the right counsel. I don't even understand really what you're going through. But if there's something that I can do to be a blessing to you, to help you through this, and I've had this happen a lot in the church over the years that I've pastored here. People have come to me and they're burdened, they've got things going on, and I don't understand everything that's going on. And I, you know, I pray for the right counsel and the right wisdom to be able to minister. Uh, but just knowing, hey, you know what, my pastor's praying for me and he cares. And that, that, that'll be enough to help me along. But there are people that, that have gifts in certain areas and they are able to minister to other people that may be going through something similar in their life. Rather than looking at it and saying, huh, you know, it's good to see them suffer for a little while. I don't, that's a wicked spirit. And if you've got that kind of spirit towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, then repent of that thing. Just get rid of it. Go home tonight and pray and ask the Lord to get that spirit out of there. And think about your brothers and sisters in the Lord and the things that they're going through. Uh, they spoke proudly against them. And it, basically what it is is they, they magnified themselves against them. They mocked them. I'm better than them. You'll never catch me doing that. You'll never catch me going through that. You think of the Edomites. They had all those resources. Diplomacy. They had the finances. They had their military. They had their defenses. Ha! Look at Israel. Look at what they're going through. We'll never go through that. We'll never struggle that way. I would never, never test God that way. As a Christian, don't ever, ever, ever test God that way. Uh, because he, he will remove your strengths, what you perceive to be strengths. And you will truly see how weak you are and how dependent you are on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. God is displeased. It's a great sin against God to hate or despise the one that God loves. Now think about that. Israel, God loved the brethren you and i god loved us he sent his son jesus christ to die for us and so to treat one another in the same manner as the edomites treated israel is a great offense against god because we're all purchased by the blood of jesus christ we are all adopted into the family of God as children of God. We are all justified, part of that body, and heading in the same direction. And so we have to be careful of that. You know, verses 13 and 14, uh, they gave the enemy assistance when attacking Israel. Uh, they should not have entered in with the enemy, in through the gates is what they did. Basically, they joined hands with the enemy. And you could see you know, the potential there for, you know, Christians or churches joining hands with the world to try to take out another Christian or another ministry. How many times has that happened? And then they seized them and their goods. So they were a part of the robbery and everything uh, that went on to Israel when they were under judgment. They also stood in their escape routes, captured those that fled and turned them over to the enemy. Imagine being that hard-hearted towards your brother that you would take those that were escaping from the enemy, capture them, and then turn them into the enemy. What a wicked, godless thing that is. Nothing about that is honoring to God. And sadly, much of that happens today. And it's nothing more than serving Satan in their treatment of other believers. And then verses 15 and 16 uh, they ignored the impending judgment of God. You know, my dad used to say, son, what goes around comes around. He always had sayings growing up, and uh, that was one of them. What goes around comes around. And then there's the biblical, an eye for an eye, and then with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And that's basically what we see happening here in verse number 15. He says, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Their treatment of Israel was going to be turned back around on them with the same treatment and no mercy. And while we see in this text, in the, the, the chapter rather, 
the focus on Edom, we also see that there will be a time in the future known as the day of the Lord. And this is when uh, the Lord will reveal his majesty and his power, sovereignty, in a glorious manner. He'll overthrow the nations, establish his kingdom here on earth. And this is also mentioned in Joel chapter 1, uh, verse number 15, and chapter 2, and in a number of other places. I'm currently working on a study in the book of Job, and there's a lot of uh, talk about the day of the Lord in the book of Job. So all nations um, are those that are leagued or against God's people. And there's, there's a time, and the time is near. There's a certainty they shall drink. And then it will be a long duration, that is to say, continually. So the Edomites are going to face judgment from God. They did rather face judgment from God. And then looking beyond or looking prophetically to the future, all nations that rise up against God will also be judged. And that is part of the prophetic calendar uh, that we can expect to see happen at some point going forward. The Bible's full of prophecy, particularly in the Old Testament. So what is the application here? What is the consideration? As I pointed out several times already, well, we talked about pride and the results of pride and what that pride leads one to, a sense of superiority uh, and something that we need to be careful of in our own lives because that pride will lead to self-sufficiency and it will also lead to harsh behavior to our brothers and sisters in Christ. I am better than so and so. I am better than them. And we gotta be careful of that thing because it will come around to us at some point if it goes unchecked. So how should we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ? I'll reiterate uh, what I said earlier. We should look at our relationships to one another in view or in light of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loves us, Jesus forgives us, Jesus restores us, Jesus guides us, he encourages us, he lifts us up, he strengthens us. If we're to model Christ in our life, if we're to be like Christ, if we're to adopt his methodology in life and how he treated people, then that is what we need to do in our lives towards one another. We should always try to seek restoration with regards to the ailing brother or sister in the event that there's a major sin issue. The other aspect of this also is we need to be an encourager. And so we look at sin, okay, there's restoration, we deal with that, but then what about the brother or sister that's dealing with something in their life and it's, it's really something that's beyond their ability to be able to cope and navigate through it. There are times when we do need each other. And, and pride says, no, I don't need anybody's help. And I've done that. I said I don't need anybody's help, and then I get into something and I realize I need somebody's help. Yeah. And that's God's way of saying, you're getting too heady, you're thinking too much of yourself, and that's why we're here. We're here to help one another and encourage one another uh, in our faith. We should have Christian charity towards one another, and obviously uh, love towards the brethren is a very important thing. You know. We, when you read church history, and we're fortunate here, we don't have persecution like the early church had. And there was a love there between the brethren that, that is very unique to that time period and the Philadelphian time period, um, you, know, you know, during the 15th, 16th century, even on, er, earlier than that, the Dark Ages, the Christians would meet and they had such a love for one another, they wouldn't turn one another in when you know the, the church came knocking on their doors to get the pastor and get the believers and set them up and say, hey, they're meeting over here, they're meeting in the woods, or you know, this this person over here, they, they have a meeting at their house and they shouldn't be and, and all that stuff. They didn't turn each other in. They loved one another, they looked out for one another. They didn't say anything when they were being tortured to reveal people. There was a strong bond and a strong love to those Christians that endured through those periods of history where persecution was at its highest. We even see that to some degree in the early uh, forming of our nation in the colonies. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of religious persecution that went on and the, the bond that the brothers and sisters had towards one another 
It went beyond the torture that they endured, the persecution they endured, all the hardship, and all that other stuff was put to the side. The, the bond between the brothers and sisters was the most important thing. And that is what helped them through those hard times. And if you read any book on martyrdom, you'll find that that is the case. It doesn't matter where it was in the world or where it is in the world, it's even happening today, that that bond between brothers and sisters in Christ is enough to give them the, the fortitude, the encouragement, and the, the strength to be able to endure the torture, the separation, the prison time, and the separation from their families and so forth. We should also seek to build up and edify. How can we build up and edify one another? How can we encourage one another? Do we think about how we can encourage one another? Do we reach across the aisle, maybe to somebody that we don't normally talk to, and say, hey, it's good to have you in church today. Is there something I can pray for you about? And, you know, maybe seek a way to build them up. Hey, I appreciate you teaching Sunday school class, or I appreciate the work you do around the church. And type of stuff like that really goes a long way in, in helping people out. And, you know, sending a note off or a text with a verse of scripture does a lot to help encourage people, too. Um, you know, we all go through these, you know, we have feelings and we get down and, and uh, you know, downcast and discouraged and everything else. So it's good to have that. Things we shouldn't do, mock or ridicule our brothers and sisters. We should not take pleasure uh, if they stumble or fall. We should not rejoice over their misfortune. Be careful of those things. The Edomites, they took every advantage they could to humiliate, to be mean, to be malicious, to be hurtful toward Israel. And God said, enough is enough, and um, set judgment their way. So next week, we'll finish up on the rest of this book, and then there'll be a little interim, and then we'll get into the book of Joel. And so... Let's take a minute and pray, and we'll dismiss for the night. Father, thank you so much for this night. And uh, Lord, I pray for your hand to be upon this uh, message. Uh, Lord, as, as weak and feeble and inadequate as I am in preparation and delivery, uh, Lord, it, it's your word, and I ask that it does what you set it out to accomplish in the hearts of your people, to build us up, to challenge us, to encourage us, in the faith. Lord, I do pray for those that are not here tonight that couldn't be here for one reason or another to minister to them. I think of those that are that are sick or ill. God, that you would bring about a healing in their life as well. And uh, Lord, just continue to bless this little church. God, help us to continue to cultivate uh, that spirit of charity in this church um, that uh, people tend to take note of when they come in. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the visitors that you're bringing to us. And uh, Lord, we just we thank you and praise you for being a great God and being merciful to each and every one of us. Lord, we know that uh, we come short of the mark each and every day. Lord, we fall short in sanctification and holiness. But Lord, you persevere in us. Lord, you are faithful. Lord, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we know that you will finish that work that you began in us and we thank you and praise you for it lord we ask that you keep us safe as we travel home tonight we pray this all in the name of your son jesus christ